So uh, we're going right down to the ground level now. I think uh, Dr. Pettish's talk was a, a great setup for what is really happening at the local level. Th these, these are the folks in front of you that are going to share some of their experiences. This is our New England-centric panel. We're going to have another panel tomorrow that's going to include folks from the San Francisco Bay Initiative that Laura uh, referred to, as well as Gulf of Mexico folks from Texas and Louisiana. So uh, we're going to start on the Northeast Coast here and then uh, go, go, go nationwide. Um, so let me just briefly introduce the panel to you, and then we'll get on to what they have to say, which is much more interesting than me. Uh, our moderator is Professor Dennis Esposito. He's an adjunct professor here. Uh, he's also a member of my advisory board. Um, he was in private practice in environmental law for 38 years, yes? 35. Now I'm recovering. Recovering attorney. Uh, and Professor Esposito also uh, has done us the favor of uh, excusing his classes for this week so that his students can come attend and learn some real live stuff. Our first presenter is Grover Fugate. Uh, he's executive director of the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council. You've already heard that referred to a few times. He's had a busy couple of weeks. Um, he's been there for nearly 25 years, and he's going to share with us uh, the Rhode Island experience of planning for climate change and sea level rise. Next, we're going to be hear hearing from Bill Taylor. He's an attorney with Pierce Atwood in Portland, Maine. He's been there in their environmental group since 1984, and his practice focuses on matters relating to water law, waste discharge, wetland and natural resource licensing, compliance counseling, rulemaking, auditing, and enforcement. Uh, today, he's going to take us north up to Maine and give us an overview of Maine's regulatory provisions relating to protecting sensitive beaches and coastal areas. Two specific issues uh, on tap, sand dune protection and FEMA floodplain mapping, and also a case study relating to construction of a seawall. Then we're going to go down to our friends in Connecticut, and we're going to uh, have two presenters split the 15-minute time slot, so they're going to be going fast and furious. Uh, we have Joe McDougald, uh, who's a professor in residence and the executive director. Your title is longer than mine. Center for Energy and Environmental Law, University of Connecticut School of Law. Uh, it's, a, it's a long one. Um, he's, he's also has a degree from Brown, so it's nice to get him back, back up into his home turf. Uh, and his co-presenter is Dr. Sima Eben, and she's with Connecticut Sea Grant. Um, they're going to talk about the law policy and practical implications uh, arising from Connecticut's approach to climate change adaptation. Uh, and this is building off of a conference that they put on last year with some funding from our, our, all of our colleagues um, at the National Sea Grant Law Center. So it's nice to connect those dots in the Sea Grant world. Uh, finally, we're going to hear from Julia Kneisel. She's, she's the Coastal Shoreline and Floodplain Manager for the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. Um, and she's going to walk us through an overview of various municipal adaptation projects that have been funded through a joint Northeast Regional Ocean Council and Gulf of Maine Council Coastal Hazards Resilience Initiative. And I also note that uh, that project has utilized the research of several of our law fellows here through our Sea Grant Law Fellow Program overseen by our very capable staff attorney, Julia Wyman. So we've got a lot to talk about. Let's get going. Grover? Thanks. And you're going to get, um, get a two-minute wait there. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to talk a little bit about our program and what we're trying to deal with in terms of climate change and sea level rise. Um, actually, it's uh, rather than shifting seas, I think when it comes to the coast, it's shifting sands. And I'd like to prove to you that sea level rise is occurring, and it's occurring very rapidly here in the New England area. Can anybody tell me who this guy is right here? Look on the front of your brochure. You'll see what used to be back in the 70s with many feet of sand in front is now that. So it is occurring here very rapidly. Here in Rhode Island, actually, we've taken a series of steps to look at coastal hazards, and this puts us sort of in a good driver's position in terms of uh, looking at adaptation and trying to deal with sea level rise and climate change. But as good as these efforts are, we're going to need more. Um, as you can see, there are a number of things here. We actually do have a ban on structural shoreline protection for our south shore. We protect our dunes. We don't allow any uh, major development on that. And we do have a sea level rise policy that we're looking at three to five feet. And as I will show you later, this may not be enough. 
um, as we go forward. The other thing that we have is, is and these are a series of other um, implementation efforts that we have. But one of the major ones that's been very helpful to us is uh, when the program was put in, we, we uh, developed a uh, barrier classification system in this state. And uh, they are classified into three categories, moderately developed, undeveloped, and developed. We don't allow any new structures, either commercial or residential, on developed, I mean moderately developed or undeveloped barriers. Those are 82% of our barriers in this state, so we don't allow development on those as part of this. Some of the other things that we're looking at as we go through the regulatory uh, realm is we're looking at adding free board for storm surge uh, and, uh, again, looking at erosion rates and trying to adjust those for sea level rise. So these are some of the efforts that are under consideration right now that we're looking at to try to improve our position for climate change. And then I'm going to focus in on one major effort that we're, we're looking at as we go forward. The shoreline change SAMP, or beach SAMP as we affectionately call it, is one of those efforts. It is our major effort that we're now looking. We're in the process of putting together the funding for this. Uh, it is a major three-year effort that will be looking at our shoreline, the entire shoreline of the state broken up into three phases. The first phase will look at the south shore of Rhode Island and Block Island. And it will be looking at uh, sea level rise, storms, and inundation. Uh, and the combination thereof as it affects our shoreline. Sea level rise, per se, we don't see too much in terms of barrier change or, or uh, frontal erosion. But when you combine that with major storm events, you do see a significant change occur in our shoreline. There's a lot of reasons for that, and these are some of the, the few that are out there. Um, but when we look at the last decade of sea level rise for our long-term record here, there is a significant acceleration component uh, to sea level rise within the last decade here in Rhode Island. And that's evidenced by some of the stuff that we see. The other thing that is kind of scary to us is these, we haven't talked a lot about this, but again with the glaciers, these meltwater pulses. These are sudden changes that can occur uh, in a system where you, in Greenland or Antarctica where you're getting uh, melting occurring and you can get a sudden shift in sea level rise with three to five feet within a decade. The problem with what we're doing here is we're sort of statically planning for an incline that uh, we're looking at when we may experience sudden shifts in sea level rise uh, that we're not prepared for. Looking at our barrier system, uh, this is sort of a sediment uh, transport model and looking at the system itself. And one of the major things that we're looking at are these downwell flow areas. Uh, we are seeing accelerated erosion in some of our areas where the double, we are almost seeing a doubling of erosion rates uh, of our shoreline uh, in some of these very sensitive areas. This is one of those areas, and as you can see here, what we're seeing, and this is side scan sonar, whoops, but we're seeing areas in here, you can see these dark channels versus these areas here. So this beach will come and go, these areas it just goes, and these channels here seem to be major conduits for sediment flowing offshore. When we look at it, you can actually see this, this is a depositional environment map uh, showing these areas, but you can see the significance of these gray areas, well, right here again, over here, and that they're very well developed here and, and quite large versus here. And again, these seem to be the conduits, and you can actually see it in aerial photography, where you can see, again, these areas, these channels are going offshore. This is carrying sediment into an area which is beyond the closure depth. The closure depth, for those who aren't coastal geologists, is that area where sediment goes and never comes back into the system again. It's at a depth where it will not return. So this is a very important feature for us to understand. Just to show you some of the results of this, this is within that general area. So what we've done is this is actual depiction of the uh, erosion maps that we have. So you can see the 1939 shoreline, the 2011 shoreline. This is sort of a progression of that same area. So in 72, nice and healthy. 92, not so good. 99, a problem. 2007, a real problem. 2012, 
these structures are now filing for demolition permits. So, we have a major issue in our South Shore area that we need to understand. And the science right now is not to the, to the development of the liking that we need. This is another shot of this area. So you can see the difference between the structures and the survival rates in terms of the foundations. This one's not too much of a problem. This one has already moved back twice in this scenario. This is its third time moving back. You can see the foundation in the offshore area here from its previous location versus that. And as you can see, this was the sand envelope that was there and the beach was out here and it's all gone. One more shot showing this area again. And you can see these foundations, there's been so much removal of the sand in the frontal area that the foundations have actually tilted and cracked and these houses are no longer habitable. So, one of the things we're dealing with here in Rhode Island, which I've already mentioned, is that in our barrier systems, we have this uh, series of events that will come, cause material to move in the offshore. Our big concern, however, is the headland areas. In the headland areas, they are just going, period. There is no coming back in these areas. And we need to uh, look at those areas very closely because there are also segments of major development here in the, in the southern part of the state. Again, there's a lot of infrastructure. This is the South Kingston Town Beach Pavilion uh, in a headland area. And uh, this structure, they're getting ready to actually leapfrog this structure back out of the frontal erosion area. But as long as this bluff continues to exist in this state, it will continue to erode quite rapidly. Just to show you what's going on, and this is sort of an analog for what we're looking at in terms of shoreline and barrier rollback. Again, this is our erosion maps. This is Napa Tree over in the Walsh Hill area. And you can see the various shorelines here. I mean, I mean the, the position of the shoreline relative to time. And what we're looking at is barrier rollback in this case. So that was the barrier in 1939. That's the barrier today. It has jumped one full length back since that period of time. We're also looking at inundation as part of this, and this is of concern because these are giving us sort of sea level rise scenarios. These are from the firms that we're working with right now. But as you can see, there's also infrastructure in these areas that has not been built to floodplain standards, and as sea level rises, these, these areas will become more exposed. The other interesting thing that uh, we're dealing with as part of this is um, FEMA, and I could go on about FEMA for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> However, um, they've, in their recent mapping, indicated that that little piece of dune that you see left there in this firm will actually trip the wave and cause it to form an A zone on the other side. And therefore, as a result of all this mapping and modeling they've done, and I could go on, for quite some time in, in discussion of the assumptions and, and whatnot, but the basic thing is that they're indicating that the flood elevations are dropping in these areas, even though we know the shoreline conditions are worsening. And as you can see, we've done some transects ourselves, and when we look at the model and they look at this erosion profile, this is sort of their conception of reality, and that's our conception of reality. Barriers do not survive storms. In 1938, 1954, the dunes were completely gone. In Sandy, many of our dunes are completely gone, and that was a tropical storm for us, not even a hurricane. We have multiple breaches in this system here. There was 200 feet of beach that that storm had to chew through before it got to these dunes that we do not have today. And they're saying that we're in a better position than we were back then. So, climate change. You've already seen this, and you can see that we're in for a ride that we're really not quite sure. And again, this is some of the evidence indicating that CO2 levels are climbing and that there is a response to sea level rise and a result to this climate, I mean the CO2 levels. But one of the interesting things to also note is that there's generally a lag within the response system. So as the CO2 starts to climb, sea level rise is not 
an instantaneous response. There's a lag within the system that we're going to see for many years, even if we were to stop to zero emissions today. And, of course, you've all seen these. The interesting thing is that we're already experiencing what some people are likening to a New Jersey climate uh, with the climate change that we're seeing already, and we could end up as far as south as Georgia in terms of our climate. One of the things that was not uh, discussed in terms of the glaciers, and this is, uh, again, some of the stuff that our scientists are bringing to us, is that um, Greenland, for the first time this year, had surface melt over the entire glacier. Uh, I mean, the, the continental glacier system. And this surface melt finds its ways down through the glacier itself through these molons. And this is what you're seeing here. This is actually a molon. But that, what that does is provide this lubricant at the base. And this sets us up for those ice pulses that we see within the system. So we're not quite sure. And that, I think a lot of what you're hearing is the science is not quite there yet. Um, in terms of trying to understand the system and how bad it's going to get for us. But as a manager, we can't operate in certainty. We have to operate in best guesses. And that's the difference between us. And we have to sort of anticipate because we wait to certainty. We've essentially sealed the fate for our citizens in terms of this. So we have to operate in a much different environment. This is what we're seeing, and some of these are the, the, the projections that are there in terms of sea level rise. But the thing is, right now, we seem to be on the worst case scenario in terms of projections. And for Rhode Island, that looks like we may be up in this realm rather than this realm. So what we're trying to do with the beach samp is try to understand the system. We want to elevate the discussion bringing in the locals, the other state agencies that are part of this, and start to look at categorizing the shoreline in terms of its susceptibility damage. Based on that, we also are going to look at what types of actions are necessary at both the local and state level that would be necessary to try to deal with some of these changes. As I said to a number of people over the, the last while, there are no more good decisions anymore in a lot of these areas. Most of what we're trying to do is make the best of a bad situation in terms of the choices that we're looking at. The beach SAMP hopefully will give us a chance to leap forward and stop reacting to this in this type of way and look at it in a much more holistic, progressive fashion, trying to come up with some solutions that, that will position us so when these events do occur, we can take advantage of that and, and hopefully make a leap forward rather than trying to rebuild back where we were. Uh, which is often the case that we're in. Thank you. Nice job. Great job. Good. Got water. Got water here. I don't, I'm very technically inept, so what do I do? This is, this is easy. I'll, I'll get you set up here. Got the clicker. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Okay. It's your razor. Yep. Excellent. I think I can handle that. Thank you, Susan. If I talk like this, can everybody hear me? In the back. Okay. As Susan said, my name is Bill Taylor. I'm an attorney in private practice in Maine, so I'm got a little different perspective maybe than some other folks here. I, ever, I tend to represent uh, landowners, municipalities that are dealing with shoreland zoning issues. For some reason, about 30 years ago, I started doing water law and I couldn't get out of it. Uh, maybe my initials have something to do with it. They are W-E-T. <laughs> and my clients very frequently say that I'm all wet, too. So uh, for better or worse, I do water law and shoreland zoning work uh, in Maine. And over the next uh, 15 minutes, I'd like to just give you a quick overview of some of the coastal programs in Maine, more from a legal perspective, uh, from some of the uh, efforts that state, federal, and non-governmental agencies are doing with respect to sea level rise. And then uh, talk a little bit about some of the major statutes and laws and regulations in Maine uh, that affect, uh, that are impacted by sea level rise. And then finally, um, a little case study on a seawall case that I was involved in, Proud's Neck, uh, in Scarborough, Maine. So it's a, it's a quick 
and a very, uh, not very thorough overview of some of the issues in Maine. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with the Maine coastline generally. Uh, to the north, it's pretty rocky, and, is, and people say there's not much impact from sea level rise on a rocky coast uh, in northern Maine, but uh, most of the infrastructure, most of the uh, population, and most of the economic activity, frankly, is in the southern Maine coastal areas where there are uh, beaches, uh, sand dunes, and extensive marshes, and those are subject to uh, some significant impacts, and we've seen that over the last uh, 20 years. Um, again, the coastal population uh, is centered on the coastal, coastal zone regions. Um, this is the rocky coast up in Machias, Machias Port, typical Maine rocky coast. Uh, you can even see in the middle of the picture, if you look closely, there's a little beach uh, with a wetland tucked in there. And some of the coastal islands up in the northern part of the state are going to be impacted significantly by sea level rise. So even though it's a rocky coast, there's still going to be impacts there. But this is, this is what we typically see in the southern Maine region, which some of you may be familiar with, Old Orchard Beach, Scarborough Beach. Uh, these, are the, these are the areas where uh, focus, focus has been on studies, adaptive planning, and infrastructure assessment uh, in, the, in the state of Maine. Uh, we do have a coastal program. It's a kind of a loosely knit program. Uh, it was developed by, uh, developed around eight, 1978 uh, under the coastal, when the Coastal Zone Management Act uh, came into effect. And it, it represents, it's a combination of about 19 state laws administered by four state agencies, and it changes its variable, it's fluid. Uh, but it does cover all of the coastal areas, and that includes towns, along the coast to their inland boundaries and coastal islands. So it's a very significant part of the state of Maine that's covered under the coastal program. Um, I will say that, uh, and we were talking about coastal zone management consistency uh, under the Coastal Mo Zone Management Act. If you comply with all of the applicable statutes in Maine, that is wetland statutes, uh, even Army Corps general permits, uh, coastal sand dune sta uh, sta statutes and laws, then you are automatically consistent under the Coastal Zone Management Act. So it's kind of a, if you comply with all applicable laws and regulations, then you are deemed to be consistent under the CZMA. Um, just quickly, let me talk about some sea level rise studies that have occurred in Maine in the last few years. And in May of 2006, I believe it was Mother's Day storm uh, 2006, there was a lot of damage on southern Maine. And then again in Patriot's Day in 2007, a lot of damage, and these storms really precipitated a lot of activity and got people off the dime, if you will. They really started to think about impacts. And of course, it's been ongoing, but not to the extent that it really started to pick up in 2006. So I think it's around 2006, uh, the Natural Resource Council of Maine, which is a, a statewide uh, environmental advocacy group, uh, yeah, it was 2006, they began one of the most comprehensive review of sea level rise impacts in Maine. They assumed a one meter rise, which is, I guess, moderate or fairly conservative now. And they looked at, uh, they actually did different scenarios. They did one meter to three meters. But um, even at one meter, they created, in Maine, a one meter rise would create 20,000 acres of new submerged lands. And the impacts to roads, treatment plants, infrastructure in southern Maine was substantial. Uh, they identified 20 high-risk towns, and surprisingly, some of them were in northern Maine, along the rocky coastline. But many of them are islands, so, uh, of course, uh, they're, they're particular, uh, particular uh, susceptible to impact sea level rise. But most of the, the uh, high-risk towns were in the southern Maine area, like uh, Scarborough, Saco, uh, Gonquit, et cetera. Um, and that was probably the best study that's been done to date in Maine on sea level rise. And they, they did um, uh, some very good mapping, overlay mapping, uh, to show impacts at one, two, three, three meter rises. And I think it woke a lot of towns up as to the uh, potential problems. Shortly thereafter, the Maine Geological Survey, which is statewide, um, or a group, uh, I think it's under the Department of Environmental Protection, or uh, it, I'm not sure where they are, uh, Department of Conservation or, or, or DEP, um, sort of an independent little uh, organization there. Uh, they did a very specific uh, planning survey in the area of the Rachel Carson Wildlife Preserve, uh, which is a beautiful uh, preserve in uh, Wells, Canyon Bunk area. 
and in the, in the adjacent Drake's Island Wells Beach, and they looked at a one to three foot sea level rise and modeled the impacts to that um, wildlife refuge. That's a national wildlife refuge. And this is the kind of mapping that they did. This is a two foot, I believe, uh, assumed a two foot sea level rise on, and the impacts on that preserve. So very significant um, kind of scenarios and impacts from a two foot rise. And by the way, that's the, um, that's the sea foot rise that the state uses as, in their assumptions in terms of coast, uh, coastal wetlands and coastal sand dunes, two foot uh, rise over 100 years. So again, that may be very conservative. And then local, as a result of some of these studies by the uh, non-governmental non organizations and, and uh, state organizations, towns started to become more active. The city of Portland's been very active. Um, I have a particular interest in this. We just moved our office to a, an office on a pier. And if we have a three foot sea level rise, it's gonna get awful wet quickly. Um, but Portland City Council has put some money up uh, to begin adapt adaptation planning. They've gotten some money from NOAA uh, nine or ten other towns are in a similar situation where they're starting to plan and uh, they have done some very extensive analysis in the city of Portland, which is a very, very progressive city, very, uh, uh, very aggressively looking at impacts um, that would occur in the city. And they are substantial. Uh, these are some of the assumptions they made. They looked at uh, highest annual tide based uh, on a 11.8 foot mean lower low mean water. Um, mean lower, low water, uh, and then assumed the 1978 storm surge, which was one of the highest on record. But interestingly, the city of Portland has some very good data. They have data going back on sea level to 1912. I believe it's one of the most comprehensive data sets on sea level rise in one place in the United States. And they are right now looking at about a 0.6 foot rise in 100 years, which is, you know, uh, very conservative, I think. They, I don't know about trends and whether that's going to escalate. Uh, I assume it may, um, and it may be different to some of the middle Atlantic states where they may have some evidence of uh, sea level escalation rise. But Maine has pretty good data over the years, and uh, these are the these are the uh, it varies obviously considerably from year to year, but the trend is clearly up, and there's clearly sea level rise going on in Portland, Maine. So that's, that's the impetus for their planning, and uh, they are doing a very comprehensive job in Portland. Uh, at the same time all of this was going on, 2006, 2007, FEMA began mapping about 24 coastal towns in the southern Maine area. And they did uh, very generic type mapping. They used very basic assumptions. And most of the towns were very upset about the way FEMA was mapping their towns. And and couldn't understand their rationale for some of the maps. And so they, most of them hired consultants to do a much more detailed mapping uh, scenarios. They uh, added some different assumptions. They put in some different uh, inputs uh, and actually improved the mapping considerably. But all of the consultants that I've talked to that were hired by these towns to look at the FEMA maps indicated that FEMA doesn't use sea level rise. They don't use long-term impacts in their, in their mapping scenarios. So, these maps are already uh, underestimating impacts. They're already out of date. And uh, the, the people that are really knowledgeable about these things say it's really a useless mapping exercise and they spend a lot of money to do it. Um, they couldn't figure out what sea level rise to use in certain situ situations, so they didn't plug, it, plug that into the model. And uh, I, I don't know where this is gonna go. This is obviously very important because it, it uh, affects your insurance, uh, flood insurance rates, um, depending on where the mapping is. So that's a very hot issue right now in southern Maine. Um, and these maps are getting a lot of scrutiny. Now, just quickly, a couple of key state laws. Um, we, three, uh, we have several state laws that are in the coastal program. I said, I, I think I mentioned 19 that are in that program. But three really kind of stand out, and I'll mention them very quickly. The Shoreland Zoning Act is a, state, it's a statewide mandatory zoning act. It requires each municipality of coastal uh, in the, on the coast or, or shoreland, and that includes freshwater uh, wetlands and rivers and streams, to adopt shoreland zoning. And they have model ordinances that the towns adopt and use. And uh, some of the assumptions, uh, some, of the, some of the factors that have to be in those, um, in those maps are um, it's basically 250 feet uh, from any 
coastal wetland uh, or tide, tide water uh, has to have a protective zone. And they look at um, one foot, they're using a one foot uh, sea level rise uh, above, one foot above the 100 year flood actually uh, as a protective measure in the shoreland zoning law. So anything built in the shoreland area has to anticipate a one foot uh, above flood stage. Um, so that is a very comprehensive act. It covers all the states. If you don't adopt the shoreland zoning ordinance in your town or city, the state will adopt it for you. Uh, and they have done that. And they will correct it if you do it wrong. So uh, that's one act that, that has really helped in terms of not only water quality improvement, obviously setbacks uh, from sensitive water bodies, but also for coastal damage and storm events. Um, Submerged lands law under the um, common law of Maine and Massachusetts, um, private citizens own to the mean low water. Uh, state owns everything below mean low water, and if you want to do any perm build any permanent structure below mean low water, that's seven months, anything that's in place more than seven months a year. So a pier that you pull out is not a permanent structure. But if you want to build a dock that's going to be there year round with pilings, then you need to get a submerged lands easement or other conveyance from the submerged, submerged lands office. And they regulate about, oh, I think I, I noted um, about two million acres of submerged lands uh, in the state. So that's a very extensive program. Um, and they obviously consider public interest and navigational issues and uh, impacts to public resources when they issue these leases. So that's an important provision for the state to use to minimize damage to uh, shoreland areas and submerged lands. And then finally, the Natural Resource Protection Act, which is a comprehensive um, act governing, uh, and I'll, I'll go into detail a little bit here, wetlands, sand dunes, great ponds, which are natural ponds over 10 acres in size, um, rivers, streams, and brooks. It also regulates things like uh, fragile mountain areas and some other uh, exotic natural resources that we have in Maine. Uh, but particularly with regard to sand dunes, as I mentioned, they have a two-foot uh, Sea, sea level rise assumption in the sand dune law. So anything built, um, again, uh, anything built in a coastal sand dune must demonstrate that the site is going to remain stable, uh, allowing for a two foot sea level rise over 100 years. And that's come into play in many, many cases and many uh, redevelopment and development uh, projects in the state of Maine. Uh, maintenance and repair is allowed, uh, can be no larger, can be no closer to the water has to be basically the same footprint, and only if, only if it's not more than 50% of the value. Um, and this has been a very controversial issue because this has been damage to seafront homes and property, how you rebuild, height you can rebuild to, where you can rebuild on the, on the sand dune has been very controversial. There's been a lot of cases. It's been very good for business, frankly. Uh, <clears throat> anything new on a sand dune has to be elevated on three-foot posts. And uh, people are generally going along with it. Uh, there have been, uh, again, some controversy about rebuilding and how much you can rebuild. But for new development, it's been pretty, uh, there's been a lot of attacks on the coastal sand dune law. Uh, Peggy Benziger from the Attorney General's office is here and she can, she can uh, testify that uh, there's been a lot of uh, rulemaking initiatives to try to change the sand dune law. A lot of coastal owners paying a lot of taxes on property feel that they're getting pinched, they can't, they can't improve their properties. Um, but uh, one of the things that I wanted to mention under the coastal sand dune law, and it's, it's, there are no new seawalls. You can repair a seawall, but you can't build a new seawall. And vertical seawalls are, there's a presumption against vertical seawalls in Maine. They're just not supposed to be built, in, and they don't like them to even be repaired uh, because they don't work. Uh, vertical seawalls get undermined and collapse very easily. Uh, but they do allow you to rebuild uh, seawalls that have been damaged. You can do something a little different than a seawall. You can do a sloped revetment or a sloped wall, but only if it's less damaging than the original seawall. And that leads me to a case, how much time do I have? A couple minutes? Am I, I'm fine? Okay. Uh, that leads me to, a, to my case study, um, which I got involved in. This is down in Prout's Neck. Uh, this is Winslow Homo, Homer country. For those who don't know uh, Maine, this is a, a very valuable, um, site for, for real estate, uh, one of the wealthiest, probably wealthiest areas in the state of Maine, Prosnack. 
And they could see the damage from the Patriot's Day storm in 2007 that collapsed a vertical seawall. My client hired uh, experts from the Woods Hole Group to look, they were getting tired of replacing the vertical seawall. It had been replaced three or four times over the last 50 years. They wanted to build something that was going to last that was, that was appropriate for the site, that had less impact, because every time it collapsed, it basically pulled out a whole section of sand dune. Uh, and this, this riprap that you see is a temporary measure that's allowed under the state law until you repair it. So they just put in some temporary riprap to stabilize the bank. Um, they proposed a slope revetment like one at Higgins Beach. That's, that's, wave action is much better. It's much better from any kind of hydrology or hydrological perspective uh, and wave, wave, wave uh, refraction and so forth. I learned a lot about slope revetments in the course of this proceeding. Uh, the, the, uh, the DEP agreed with us, the Department of Environmental Protection agreed with us that it was better in every respect for stability. But, and this is actually, this is a storm that occurred while we were actually rebuilding the wall. So you can see the, the impacts have been pretty significant in this area. The DEP denied the sloped revetment on two grounds. One, that there were seawalls, vertical seawalls adjacent to it and the transition zones between a slope revetment and a vertical wall was going to cause more problems than it solved. So it was the transition zone that they were concerned about. They worried that there was going to be failure at those transition zones. And the second reason they denied it was that because it's sloped, as opposed to vertical, you're impacting more sand dune. Obviously, you can't extend it any further out under the rules, but you're, you're leaning that wall back and therefore impacting sand dune behind the wall. Now, there was no sand dune behind the wall because it was in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but under their, you know, under their analysis, they believed that the sand dune could be restored to some minimal value. And so we ended up building a vertical wall back, which will fail and which we will be replacing again. I believe the real reason that they denied the project, and this is just my opinion, was for aesthetics. They didn't want a slope revetment in the middle of a series of vertical walls. And it really came down to neighbors complaining about the look of the wall, the slope revetment versus a vertical seawall. You can see the vertical seawall looks nice. It looks uniform. Uh, but the guys from the Woods Hole Group uh, that designed these walls and designed these slope revetments tell me it's going to fail uh, in the near future. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to the next person. Thank you. So I, I always like local issues. No one talks about the consumption of petabytes of HD video, something my boys call a good weekend. Um, I like the, uh, the uh, it, just before the break, the last question was, where are the banks in local development, asked by my, my colleague up there. Um, part of what I like to talk about and what um, my, my compatriot Sima and I uh, held a conference last spring about was really, where's the local government? In Connecticut, may, perhaps more than many other places, but like much, like much of New England, the zoners control so much of what happens to the reality of our coastline. And it happens so much in a way that, um, that really, when we're talking about where do we readjust the coastal area, where do we readjust the high tide line, the area behind it, in our case, the, the, the coastal zone, is in uniquely local control. So I want to tell you a little bit of a story in just seven minutes, since we're a, we're a, a split group. Um, I want to talk a bit about the problem in Connecticut that I think highlights the problem of local control uh, when it comes to trying to adjust and adapt to the sea level. I want to talk a little bit about a, uh, a response to Hurricane Irene, some changes it made, and then a bit about one of the results that came out of the, the real way that a conference just like this one that we held with Sea Grant is making a real difference in Connecticut. So here we go. I've got like 30 seconds. So in Connecticut, we have a mismatch of authorities. It, it, for those of you that don't know, there are 169 towns. 
we have no county government structure at all. 169 towns trying to figure out 169 ways that their, in their coastlines, many of them are common, are adjusting to sea level rise. That situation alone is incredibly complicated. There's a bit of a split authority as to how sea levels get, how sea walls specifically get treated. I want to talk mostly about the area behind, the ones that would be affected by the, uh, the, local, uh, the local commissions. But those commissions, aside from the fact they have differing levels of expertise and resources available to them, also have differing incentives. So two deciders. Um, this statute, actually someone from uh, the office that handles this at the DEP is sitting in the middle, um, is, how, is how our DEP will take care of seaward um, seawalls. But one of the areas we have is an, uh, the Coastal Management Act that puts part of that review with a recommendation from our DEEP in the hands of the local commissions. So the local commissions sit there. Can I just ask, how many of you have ever been to a zoning committee, a zoning meeting? And as you probably know, the, the, num the largest, uh, a few years ago, the largest single profession of zoners in Connecticut used to be realtors. That was by far the biggest thing of what people did for a living. The second was zoning, uh, of the zoners was, were lawyers, so equally godless, of course. <laughs> but that's who we were. Uh, planning and zoning commissions, the people deciding about half of them are elected and half of them are appointed in our state. Um, but also our state, our towns, our schools are funded by property taxes. Most of the top property revenue is coming from the coastal areas. I'm a selectman in the town of Madison. Madison, by far, most of our budget is paid for by the coastal area. I'd like to think that when I was a zoner for a decade, that of course I was absolutely pure in my motives, and I think most people are, but the incentives and the way, the way government lines up, this is an inherent complex, uh, conflict. We do receive, as I, as I mentioned before, recommendations and guidance from the DEEP. Structurally, Connecticut is a home rule state like many New England states. The government can't, the state government leaves us alone, specifically in land use. There's a long case history supporting us in that basis. But we do have certain municipal powers. Um, uh, one of my friends is John Nolan at, at uh, Pace Law School. He, he loves this section of the Connecticut General Statutes. It goes on and on and on and quotes our specific corporal powers. I like the fact we can regulate vice as a selectman. I always think that's something we'll just never touch. But up until recently, this was one of our primary powers. 7148, blah, 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 uh, provide for the protect protection and improvement of the environment, including but not limited to coastal areas, wetlands, adjacent areas to waterways. This was part of the municipal, the town power, outside of the zoning power, to begin to adjust to um, the coastal area. Separately, we have the Coastal Management Act that places every new seawall, every new development to a specialized level of review. However, there have been two schools of thought in Connecticut. One is that these local commissions have very limited environmental authority. The primary book on Connecticut land use being put out right now tells people you have very little authority. Hence, you couldn't consider sea level rise. Another school of, uh, of thought, which I've been polluting to my own students, and I think I'm right, says that they actually have very broad authority, but pr most practitioners would tell a commission, you can't consider sea level rise, and I've experienced that myself. So this area was fairly unclear until Hurricane Irene. A new bill came in response to, uh, came in response to it, and this is language lifted from the Office of Legislative Research, that Public Act 1180 changed some of that so there could be structural consideration in the legal process in Connecticut. Um, very briefly, one of it is that it says you'll acknowledge private property owners' rights, but you'll also now consider the, pres the prospect of sea level rise. That clarified part of the issue that was a practical split in how these small towns were considering it. Two, there's a state policy to establish it. Three, and this is actually more important than I think it would appear, requires a coastal site plan to include a topography-based assessment. Imagine those people in the zoning hearing trying to establish whether or not sea level rise, this is the house, this is the time where we say this one is too much of a problem. Without the topography, it's almost impossible for them to make that assessment and to be comfortable they're being fair, which is really what they want. The, we talked about vulnerabilities to it, and they also arrange, of course, for a compensated retreat. So one of the things that happened is last spring, and, and Simma will pick up on this point, we held in conjunction with the law school and with Sea Grant a conference on climate adaptation. 
a, a happy consequence of that is that a group of legislators are doing just what you want them to do. They formed a task force of the coastal and impacted areas to try and address what new findings they can come up with, what new laws will help the state government and these municipalities adjust more rapidly to sea level rise. Some of the findings they're talking about, Sima will touch on, came directly out of our conference, a conference not unlike this. And most of it is focusing on a municipal and a local impact because, frankly, that's the opportunity to do the most good on an adaptation ba basis and perhaps has done the most damage over time. And I'm right on time. Thank you. Now I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thank you for inviting me here. It's been terrific listening to all these very interesting talks this morning. Uh, I'm going to pick up from what Joe was talking about and talk about a conference that we developed. And I'm going to kind of talk about some of the ideas that were generated at that conference uh, that the task force is now considering. Uh, I want you to know, since I have a lot of uh, the folks, actually several of the folks who presented at the conference are presenting here, so I'm going to go really quickly through their ideas, because they may present them. I know Carol and Carp already did. But you can get all the conference proceedings online at the Sea Grant um, Law and Policy Journal, and the presentations and, um, and the video of the conference are also online at the Connecticut Sea Grant uh, website, and I'll give you those. Uh, URLs at the very end, but in case I'm rushed at that point, I wanted to tell you that. Um, so, uh, you know, as you all know, and you've heard this morning, in case you didn't, we're really now seeing tangible evidence of climate change. We're seeing rising sea levels, we're seeing um, increasing sea surface temperatures and atmospheric temperatures, and we're also getting much more uh, larger, more extreme storms. And in Connecticut, we've had in the last uh, 15 months, we've had what I've heard of as three, or they've been classified, I've heard about 100 year storm events. Uh, and uh, in March of 2010, we had a 500 year flood event. So we're getting these events and it's making us think about these things. States and communities are starting to think about them. They're trying to see how they can adapt to a changing climate, trying to see how they can enhance their resilience to these extreme weather events. So they're trying to look at their vulnerabilities to coastal hazards. They're starting to plan. Um, and you know, into this mix, it seemed like an opportune time for Joe and I to come together uh, and start to think about um, putting together this conference. Uh, to look at policy constraints and opportunities that might exist uh, for communities and the state to enhance its resilience to climate change and coastal hazards. So we did that. We wanted to first uh, look at assessing Connecticut's legal framework for adaptation and then also uh, explore the range of innovative policy options that exist out there that folks are working on or actually already implementing in other states. So that was kind of the framework. Uh, and as Joe mentioned, Connecticut is really a perfect policy model to uh, look at local-based climate change because we are a home rule state. And in fact, it's some of the, um, the structure of government and the perverse incentives that it creates that are some of the most problematic impediments to adaptation. So they're kind of <laughs> makes it a, a challenge. So our Legal Solutions Conference was novel in a number of ways. It allowed Joe and I to forge a relationship between Connecticut Sea Grant and the School of Law Center for Energy and Environmental Law that Joe now leads. Uh, and we also wanted to make it a multidisciplinary discussion. Uh, we wanted to include technical experts, legal scholars, policymakers, academics, practitioners, and we also opened it up for students. We uh, sent out a competitive call for papers and we disse disseminated that call really broadly, just, you know, actually went out nationally, regionally. So we had a pretty good um, response. Uh, we had uh, collaborative funding for our conference, too, between the National Sea Grant Law Center, who I want to thank, also Connecticut Sea Grant, the Nature Conservancy, and uh, the School of Law also contributed funds. 
we wanted to have an audience with legislators and policymakers because we wanted, we went into this conference wanting to make a difference. So we located it at the School of Law, which is in Hartford, uh, so that there was access to the General Assembly and um, the state capitol. And then we set out to invite representatives from all coastal communities. We invited um, our entire General Assembly, the federal delegation, um, uh, we invited commissioners and representatives from, you know, most large, uh, most Connecticut state agencies, including DEEP, OPM, the Department of Insurance. Um, we invited the regional planning agencies, environmental NGOs, and also law firms. And we had actually so many people register that we had to close off registration several days early because we were like overfilled and we had already moved to the largest room that we could. So it had a really good outpouring of interest. And we, we given the, the number and diversity of our audience, we wanted them to have tangible input into the findings from the, the uh, conference. So we asked our audience to uh, discuss with their fellow in attendees what they thought would be their top three policy priorities and then to write them down uh, and we collected them. And so what you're going to hear from me today is some of those contributions as well as some of the ideas and slides that were presented by, by our um, contributors. Um, and I also just want to echo Joe in saying that, you know, really the cool thing about this conference was the Shoreline Preservation Task Force that was formed, was actually formed that day, it was an the announcement was made that day, and the chair of that committee, Representative James Albus, uh, was at that conference and we were able to meet him, and really we were able to get a real direct conduit between the findings of our conference and this new legislative task force. Um, so, Again, I'm just gonna go really quickly, and I apologize, because uh, I like this phrase, I'm a recovering New Yorker, so I'm gonna <laughs> apologize in advance. I'm, I'm gonna just whip through some of the, the interesting ideas, and just to know that things like um, overlay zones, um, rolling easements, living shorelines, uh, you know, kind of the resolution of takings issues, these were all things that this, our task force, our, our conference, and now the task force are grappling with, and, and ideas they're actually focusing on. So these are some of the, the, the talk, actually all the talks, except for our keynotes that we had. Um, oops, excuse me. Our, 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 our let me, uh, oh, I'm gonna have it back up, let's see. This is our, our first talk, or the first talk I'm gonna talk about was actually Jessica Granis and uh, Julia Wyman, who are both here with their students, Jenna Schof, Megan Singer, and Colin Lynch. And they developed a tripartite zoning scheme uh, that uh, focused on um, basically dividing up coastal areas into three zones, a protection zone, an accommodation zone, and a conservation zone based on the density of development within them and the types of natural resources. Uh, in the uh, protection zone, this would be your higher density areas. They, uh, with critical infrastructure, you would use um, shoreline armoring and to protect those types of zones. Uh, in accommodation zones, which would be in less developed areas, uh, you would use um, soft shoreline armoring. You would require more resilient design and uh, limit your critical facilities. And this is kind of uh, where we, Connecticut is right now in terms of doing that, sorry. <laughs> And in, uh, well, skip through that. In our conservation zone, uh, which would be the areas with a high um, value natural resources, low development, we would have um, a retreat uh, strategy, basically relocating development. We would create natural buffers uh, and uh, restrict rebuilding um, in order to preserve the natural resources in those areas. So a lot of their talk uh, focused on whether this was doable in Connecticut, and what they found was that accommodation is something that always, already is occurring or is uh, you know, doable. Uh, there are more questions about the conservation and uh, protection zones. So um, they also focused uh, on rolling easements, which uh, first were used in Texas and now are adopted broadly in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Maine, North and South Carolina, uh, and these, um, Oops. Uh, these types of uh, uh, easements allow um, 
homeowners to uh, you know, retain, develop lands adjacent to the coast, but there are limits on that uh, use of them to ensure that it doesn't impact the uh, coastal resources or interfere with natural shoreline processes. So that was another thing they focused on. All right, another talk we had was by the group from Harvard Law, which was um, uh, presented by Sarah Fort, Wendy Jacobs, and Nicole Rinke. And they had a number of ideas. They'd been doing work in South Boston, and they applied their case study there to Connecticut. And just to briefly recount two of their thoughts, one is looking at using overlay uh, zoning uh, to promote particular resources or purposes such as using freeboard regulations to increase building ele elevations. So that was one of these, these uh, uh, ideas that they're suggesting in the South Boston area that could probably be exported to Connecticut. Um, another focus of theirs was looking at procurement or purchasing uh, policies to achieve adaptation goals um, so that you could uh, consider life cycle costs in your um, purchasing decisions and also uh, build in climate resilient um, criteria into those decisions. So those were some of the things they talked about. We had an uh, interesting talk by David Lewis um, from Georgetown. He has done two case studies uh, in, the, in the Gulf states, kind of post-Katrina, what have we learned? And he looked at the Louisiana Road Home Program and the Mississippi Coastal Improvement Plan. Uh, these are both areas where flood mitigation is occurring or has occurred through property acquisition. The key differences in those two areas was, is that the Louisiana Road Home Program has been heavily, has been funded and is implemented. The Mississippi one has yet to receive funding, so it's still in the planning stage. Um, he did have a few uh, take home messages, which is that pre-disaster planning is really preferable. Once you have a disaster, that kind of fog of war, or whatever you want to call it, the fog of disaster, really makes it difficult to go about acquiring properties in any kind of prior, you know, um, with a prioritization, with any kind of you know, plan. Uh, so it's really important to establish acquisition priority zones, also to assess the spatial variability of coastal risks beforehand in order to create an incentive structure. He found the incentives were kind of perverse, where in Louisiana it was actually um, uh, the uh, incentives were to uh, rebuild in place rather than to relocate. So you have to get that right in terms of your risks. You also want to incentivize people in your high risk areas to be the ones to relocate. Um, and uh, he also said that you should do your acquisition plan with a um, uh, targeted redevelopment. So I see that um, I have someone sitting there. I'm going to just, is that it? Um, let me just flip to the end. We had, uh, I want to just give you my, my conclusions. Ah. <laughs> so these were some of the conclusions that we got from our, um, from our audience and from the discussions that followed. Basically, the way, oh, this isn't my conclusions. There, there it is. I told you they'd be there. Um, the way forward in Connecticut is likely going to have to be a collaborative process. It's going to have to involve all levels of government, local and state, as well as federal. It's going to have to involve researchers as well as practice practitioners, te technical policy and legal perspectives, and they're going to have to forge partnerships to actually deal with this. We're going to have to address environmental justice issues. This is one thing that wasn't stated. I was really interested in the early, the earlier morning panel because it seemed like uh, those are issues that are really um, critical and need to be kind of uh, directly addressed. Engi engineering solutions aren't going to solve anything, or everything rather. <laughs> they may solve a lot of things. But we do need to really focus on education, outreach, uh, and look at really innovative communication strategies. That's probably the Connecticut Sea Grant person in me talking. Um, and in Connecticut, as you heard, we're probably going to have local implementation, but really local areas don't have the expertise or the funds to deal with this. So the state is going to provide leadership, guidance, support, uh, and it's going to be a really critical partnership or collaboration there. It's going to need to be coordinated as well. Uh, and it's also really important to integrate um, these, these uh, plans into ongoing plans to kind of get your value added out of it. And so I'm going to conclude and just say that uh, it's really, um, really heartening to see 
um, you know, these, these uh, conference attendees uh, and as well as the findings from the conference being taken up by this task force and actually put into policy. It's not often that it happens where you have a conference that actually gets to move the policy forward, but in the case of our conference, it really seems like that was the case. And thanks for giving me a few extra minutes. Hello, everyone. I get to uh, run the last leg of this panel, and I'm really happy that I'm in this position because I get to provide some um, excellent examples of municipal actions that are currently funded through the Northeast Regional Ocean Council. And the reason I get to present the NROC perspective on coastal hazards is because I currently co-chair that committee with Department of Interior as well as NOAA staff. And our primary goal with the NROC Hazards Resilience Committee is actually to elevate this issue of climate and how it intersects with all of the current hazardous conditions that we have in coastal communities, primarily erosion and flooding on a chronic um, condition, but also associated with storm events. So the goal of our committee is really to get um, the latest and greatest data tools and other information out to all levels of government, um, outside government, to try and advance this issue. And we are a highly collaborative group, and we really, you know, leveraged our partnership with the Gulf of Maine Council on the Marine Environment to get an award from NOAA's Climate Program Office to be able to move forward with these municipal grants that I'm going to describe. And in addition to the Municipal Technical Assistance Grants, we also have partnerships with this university as well as Clean Air, Cool Planet, and the Storm Smart Coast Network to try and really bring case studies and other best practices to light and to share them with those individuals that really have a role to play in this and can really you know, help us um, move forward. Like I said, uh, we put out a solicitation and we focused that solicitation on highly collaborative, multi-level projects, but that had some real feet on the ground and was building on all of the existing policies and regulations and other mechanisms that we have in the communities to address this issue of climate change focused primarily on sea level rise. The project that we picked in Maine is focused on the Ogunquit sewage um, treatment plant. And unfortunately, in this community, the plant is located on a barrier island, which is very low lying and extremely vulnerable to the current floodplain, um, not to mention you know, the future floodplain. And they brought together uh, a team of engineers and planners, as well as geologists, to take a look at the different inundation scenarios on the plants and to come up with some potential options for moving forward. The initial responses were, well, you know, let's just take an engineering approach and elevate the entire um, plant. That may or may not be feasible. So what are some other options? How about looking at the actual barrier itself and looking at some natural restoration of the island to provide some buffering during storm events? Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. But ultimately, a lot of discussion was focused around either relocating the plant off of the barrier um, or potentially working with a neighboring municipality to increase the capacity there and connecting in their community's um, infrastructure. And I think this is the way that they will be going. The discussion is still ongoing. And I encourage you to go to the Agunquit Sewer District website. Um, that's where the preliminary engineering report is available for review. And 
Um, we're pretty excited about this one. It is a very um, tangible product and is very relevant to a lot of other communities in our region. Moving down to New Hampshire, we got an excellent response from the city of Portsmouth. They were actually looking at doing a more comprehensive um, look at adaptation within the community. And we funded them to not only look at some sea level rise scenarios on critical infrastructure in the community, but also to do a good amount of public outreach. They are, you know, undergoing quite a few public meetings to try and raise this issue in the community and to get input on um, opportunities within the community to be more resilient. And ultimately, um, they have completed some inundation maps. Uh, they aren't available to all of you as of yet, but um, they will be soon. And that information will be integrated into their master plan, hopefully, in the next year or so. Moving down to Massachusetts, the pilot project here um, is on the South Shore, south of Boston. And this was the only um, pilot project that actually brought together three communities, Marshfield, Situate, and Duxbury. They were quite interested in also doing a vulnerability assessment for the three towns. And this vulnerability assessment um, primarily is focused on the seawalls that they have lining those three communities, which were put in place largely in the 40s and 50s, which are in um, less than desirable condition. A number of them um, are failing as we speak, ignoring nor'easters and other coastal storms. Um, but they're also interested in looking at their natural resources as well, such as their salt marshes and sh uh, shellfish beds. And in addition to the vulnerability assessment, they plan to have a much more um, detailed dialogue on adaptation strategies for the community, building on the Wetlands Protection Act and other um, mechanisms that they have already in place. This project um, is quickly following on the heels of another adaptation study that these three communities um, worked on with our regional planning agency in that area, as well as our office. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, these three towns are um, quite vulnerable and receiving the lion's share of the flood insurance claims for the state. As you can see here, almost uh, 25 percent. And in this preliminary study, there was um, much discussion at public meetings on increasing setbacks to accommodate a shifting shoreline and rising seas. But also, you know, the community is interested in being a little more proactive about natural responses versus strict engineering um, approaches. And you can find this preliminary adaptation study that the three towns worked on on the Town of Marshfield's website. Moving down to Rhode Island, um, this is another real on the ground project that we funded. It's the Block Island Ferry Terminal. And actually, um, the terminal facilities on the island as well as on the mainland. And they are um, in the process of finalizing an engineering study uh, to look at a number of different mechanisms to increase the resilience of the terminal. And it ranges from elevating the entire port infrastructure itself to possibly looking at relocating some of the um, access ways to higher elevations. And also looking at um, fortifying in place, given the water dependency of this structure. When um, the engineering report uh, is available to the public, uh, we can share that. And all of these efforts are going to be highlighted on our Storm Smart Coast Network website, which I will um, provide the link to later. So Connecticut was actually fortunate to get two funded projects. Um, Greenwich was looking at focusing on some low-lying areas within their community. And when I say low-lying, I actually mean um, the first floor and sometimes the second floor below the base flood elevation. They actually um, went ahead and compiled all of the elevation certificates that they had on the books for the community. 
and also updated ones that were either missing or um, somehow out of date due to um, any kind of redevelopment or reconstruction. And they did a, an assessment of the vulnerable areas based on this information. And what was most striking was that 80% of the structures within the floodplain was below the base flood elevation. Let that sink in for a minute. And ultimately, what they're planning to do with this information is to incorporate it into a review of their zoning regulations to really you know, get out the, the public safety um, aspects of the municipal role, but also in a more immediate sense, they're providing this information to their local emergency managers so that um, in both preparedness as well as response, they have the information they need to be able to target the specific cells within the community that are most at risk and need um, you know, evacuation support primarily. The other project in Connecticut is in the town of Guilford. And this is another um, project along the lines of Portsmouth, where they're really looking at doing a more comprehensive assessment of the long-term impacts, as well as you know, the adaptation strategies that are tied to that. And they um, partnered primarily with the Nature Conservancy to use their tool to do the inundation scenarios for the municipality, which they're then using to um, develop their uh, adaptation strategies. And they, like most of the municipalities in our region, definitely recognize that there's opportunities to improve infrastructure that we have in our communities, as well as you know, possibly be a little creative and think about some new regu regulations um, and improvements in our um, natural resource areas. They have a draft um, coastal resilience action plan out there now with their short and long-term strategies. You can find that on Guilford's website, and the link is here. And in that, you'll um, see some good discussion on their existing zoning regulations, wetlands regs, and um, a few other mechanisms, mechanisms that they can use to kind of manage development and natural resource areas. At this point, I really want to recognize all of the players um, that are part of NROC's Coastal Hazards Resilience Committee. You know, this committee has you know, expertise from the federal agencies as well as the state environmental agencies and some NGOs as well. And we're very excited to have the funding from NOAA's Climate Program Office to be able to dig down and really provide some good local technical assistance and then use that information to um, disseminate it to a broader audience so that um, other municipalities in similar situations can be inspired, hopefully, um, to take a few steps forward towards adaptation. So come uh, August um, of this coming year on the Storm Smart Coast Network website, we will have the case studies that Roger Williams um, has developed, as well as other um, communications tools from Clean Air, Cool Planet, and the municipal um, technical assistance project uh, materials all on this website. Are there any uh, fellows in the audience that worked on the case studies for Roger Williams? Anyone? Ah, uh, all right. <laughs> well, so, you know, I really want to just uh, to thank everyone involved in this. I mean, this is not really my work. It's just kind of bringing all the pieces together. And, and I think uh, we're doing a pretty good job in this region. So I'll wrap up there. All right, we're going to open it up for questions, and we will resume with our, our traveling mics and inviting questions from webinar participants. And please remember to just state your name and your affiliations. Uh, Professor Esposito, I turn it over to you to moderate. Thank you, Susan. Uh, we had our panel uh, discuss, uh, good, very good discussions, studies, policies, and actual regulatory implementation uh, that covers all but 11 miles of the coastline in New England. That's, that's all of New England. So that should be some very fertile ground for some questions. So let's have at it if we could. Gentleman over here. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Paul Hallward again from uh, University of Connecticut. Um, some politicians said just very recently, ne never waste a good crisis. And it seems that we, yeah. uh, well, th this, this thought um, um, occurred to me when, uh, when Simmer was, was talking, but I think it applies to all of you <laughs> that uh, the, uh, the, the storms, the climate change I I is a disaster, it's a headache. Uh, it's also an opportunity um, and, and for some people. There are um, about 31 states in the United States, none of them, I believe, in New England, that practice mitigation banking. And the way mitigation banking works is for a mitigator to buy up uh, wetland uh, and, and may, maybe improve it, and then it's awarded credits by the Army Corps of Engineers, and those, those um, uh, credits then get sold, the mitigation banker makes a profit on it. And it seems that, that, that with the coastal flooding that's going on, uh, for the, 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 really the need in the United States to recover wetland, uh, coastal and inland, uh, the United States uh, over a century or so has lost over 50% of its wetland, that uh, th there would be a, a, a case to bring in mitigation bankers to, to profit from the, 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 the extended coastal flooding. And I, I guess my question is, why isn't New England getting involved with mitigation banking? <laughs> Can I respond first? Who wants to handle that? I'll, I'll start. Go ahead, Maine, Bill. I'll start in the north. We can work south. Uh, in Maine, we do have wetland mitigation banking. We have several wetland mitigation uh, projects right now that are active. Uh, however, they're primarily for freshwater wetlands. There's very little coastal wetland filling allowed in Maine to begin with. And when you mitigate, you have to mitigate in kind, usually in the same watershed. So because there's very little coastal wetland, a lot of wetland filling or, or uh, yeah, filling or, or other disturbance allowed, we don't have very much coastal wetland banking. But we could if, if a coastal wetland was filled. Uh, so that's kind of a limitation in Maine. Anybody else? The, the one thing that I would point out is we have policies in our program that require, at least for coastal wetlands, if there's filling, then it has to occur at least for fringe marsh on a three to one basis. So in those cases, we're actually gaining wetland. The thing that we're noticing, though, is that our wetlands are drowning in place in many instances due to these seawalls and topographic change that we're seeing in Rhode Island. So while we may see some small gains, the overall loss, I think, is going to be more significant uh, in the coastal environment than what we could ever gain through mitigation banking. And I think one other issue um, that comes to my mind, especially if we're talking about coastal intertidal marshes, you've got a public trust doctrine issue there. If it's intertidal, the state owns the fee there. So the public, uh, the private owner, is filling state land to begin with, so shouldn't be allowed to fill the state land. And if he does, uh, in those high water states, in those high water states, that's right. We do have a, some little weirdos here from Massachusetts, don't in we? Maine. In Maine, 16 rods would mean low water, right? Which, whichever is greater. In those high water states, Grover corrects me. We do have a public trust issue there too. Next question. You got. I'm Tom Linton from Texas A&M University. The question is, Dr. Eben, you mentioned in your presentation you listed a whole bunch of states that uh, loved rolling easements. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Was that just a theory? We've just had the cat put amongst the pigeons in Texas because of rolling easements. Well, it, was, it wasn't a theory. It was something that was said in one of our paper, in one of the papers that was presented that Texas had the, I think it was the, um, Rolling Beaches Easement Act. That was the first to go forward with it, and then Beaches, I believe, uh, Oakland Beaches, Beaches Act, which was based on a rolling easement, and that other states have uh, adopted similar uh, easements. I, I don't, I don't n know the context of those. You need to come to the panel tomorrow afternoon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. We actually have two communities in Massachusetts that have rolling easements on the books um, in local ordinance. And the problem with implementing that is really um, the logistics and the banking as well as providing the incentives for private property owners to proactively um, engage in that process. 
but we're hoping through some case studies that Julia is working on to kind of advance this a little bit um, in the region. Next, any uh, other questions? Any over here? Hi, Tim Faulkner from Eco RI News. Uh, who pays for the construction of the barriers? I'm looking at those barriers in Prout's Neck, Maine, in particular. But uh, any artificial barriers on private property, especially? The uh, the seawalls on Prout's Neck are paid by the landowners, by the private landowners, because in Maine we're one of the funny states. Uh, adjacent landowners own to the mean low water, and so they are well above mean low water, and they're on private property. And, and, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, and, and most of the hard problems, we sort of look at where the, the policy action is in Connecticut, is 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 privately driven. The the hard problems are coming really with, like as one of the other presenters showed up, what do you do with the inconsistent seawall, even if it's better in a, what is otherwise an aesthetic and, and uniform row, and that th those are the places where the policy the, it, it needs to be pushed. I saw a hand over here. Was there a question? Um, I had a question for uh, Mr. Taylor about whether or not you've seen any increase in litigation between property owners because of downstream impacts from armoring, and if you, if there's been any thought in any of the states about ways to incentivize the removal of armoring and get people to, to go back to a natural shoreline approach. Uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, we have seen a little bit of that along uh, Wells Beach, Drake's Island, uh, where landowners have different philosophies about armoring. And uh, it has arisen to litigation in a couple cases, but not significant. Um, they usually have associations for the whole beach, and so they try to, try to get consistency. Uh, so that kind of avoids it. But occasionally we do have, we do have litigation between. We have a lot of reporting uh, you know, on neighbors. Some neighbor will do something, you know, repair their seawall without a permit, for example, and they will be reported to the Attorney General's Office or the DEP. So we have a lot of uh, t telling tales out of school. Um, but litigation is rare. I would just add to that that, that coastal re residents are known to be litigious by bias. <laughs> but the, uh, we, there's been a noticeable trend of increased participation at seawall approval hearings at the municipal level. It seems to me that the, the interest, and a lot of people do mention this very issue, um, that they're, bringing, they're going into the Coastal Management Act hearings. And, and saying, what about when this, when this fails? So it, it, it's not litigation yet, but it's at least a topic of active discussion where I don't think that was true just a short time ago. The, the, uh, from the Rhode Island perspective, that's the seawall issue that we were dealing with uh, and have been dealing with and will continue to deal with here in Rhode Island. Um, this is the adjacent property owner to a town property that owns a road who wanted to shore up the road by driving uh, steel sheet pile in front of the town road. And this individual has sued the town <laughs> for attempting to put that in because they believe it will transfer the, uh, the resulting energy to their property and accelerate the erosion. Despite the fact that that seawall you see there is an illegal seawall and under enforcement order from us. Any other questions? Any questions? Well, we have time for one more. Gentlemen, sir. Uh, hi, Al Bowright, uh, retired legislative counsel, Vermont. Um, I'm wondering about um, Massachusetts in particular, uh, sea rise issues in urban populations such as Boston, and particularly the bridge, I mean the, the dam at the Science Center that holds the it seems that the, the climate scientists have different sea level projections than the, than the, than the builders. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way to, pros to cross-pollinate this so that the building will be based upon the current climate science Definitely. instead of the climate science that existed when the building project started 15 years ago? Go to North Carolina. <laughs> 
So the uh, state legislature in Massachusetts passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, which um, started a, a dialogue amongst the state agencies as well as a number of other partners on this issue. And they recognize that, you're right, we are going to have to look at our engineering design standards and figure out how to align those more in reality. And, um, you know, it's going to be a challenge in the city of Boston because, you know, the, the immense infrastructure that's already in place, it's really going to be a, a protection approach and it's going to require a lot of funds. So, you know, I don't have a short answer for you, um, but all I can say is that it has been flagged and hopefully we will be able to, you know, advance the discussion in the short term. That's it. Thank you. Well, I want you to join me in thanking our, our local Northeast panel.